So we are continuing with the VAT and we are, we are looking at questions on VAT. So today we are going to look at a question that was done in November 2018, question number 2C. November 2018, question number 2C on VAT. November 2018, question number 2, 2C. So the question reads, Bandica Limited, a company dealing in a variety of value added tax VAT designated goods was registered for VAT purposes on 1st March 2018. So the following transaction are recorded for the month of March 2018. March 10, open in stock, 9,200 units, valued at 85 shillings per unit. March 5th, imported 10,000 units of 80 shillings per unit, being cost insurance and freight CFI. March 8, purchased 5,000 units from the local market at 60 shillings per unit. March 9th, sold 6,000 units at 90 shillings per unit. 12th March, purchased office furniture for 40,000 for use in the business. 15th, paid 10,000 for photocopy and printing of office documents. Uh, March 16th, purchased oil filters and lubricant to use in the factory. And then paid an invoice on 16th of 85,000 respect of fuel for company vehicles. The fuel had been used in February 2018. Number on my date, supplied 30,000 units to the department, the national treasury at a price of 85 shillings per unit. And then 28 sold 25,000 units at 90 shillings per unit to the company in Uganda. And then on 23rd, purchased on credit 25,000 units locally at 80 shillings per unit before deducting a discount of 85%. On 27, the directors appropriated goods valued at 320, which were not paid for, and then paid electricity expense of 50,000, telephone expense 6,000. All transactions were inclusive of VAT at the rate of 16%, where applicable unless otherwise specified. Assume the rate of import duty is 20% required. So here we said you check the nature of transactions, whether the trader is dealing with both taxable goods and exempt. So according to our reading, this trader is only dealing with taxable. There are no exempt sales or purchases. So now when you don't have, we said you come up with the VAT account. So you come up with VAT account neatly. So you come up with VAT account. So Bandika is a company, so for the month of April. So you Bandika, Bandika Limited. So we write there Bandika. So we have Bandika, Bandika Limited. Then you write there VAT account, VAT account. So for the months, for the months of March 2018, March 20, 18 shillings and thousands, shillings and thousands. So this side, we said you record input VAT, input tax or input tax, input tax, you can write here input tax. And this side, you record output tax. Input tax is a tax that you are charged when you buy goods for sell. Because this company was registered for the first time in March, 2018. So you're going to claim VAT on the opening stock because it's the first time of registration. But going forward, you don't necessarily claim VAT on open source because you'll have claimed it before. But because it's the first date of registration, you're going to claim VAT. So you're right there, March 10th. So March 10th, 10th March. So there's opening stock. You're going to claim the opening stock because it's the first time of registration. So you're going to be 16 out of 116 in bracket, 9,200. 9, times 85. So we are told that all the values indicated here are in inclusive of VAT, meaning any figure that is given here is inclusive of VAT. Therefore, you determine the 16%. So it means any value that you get is 116%. 100, 
So you, you want to know what will be 16. So you cross multiply that will be 16 out of 116 times that value. How much will that be? 107, it is 62. Point zero. So you can just round it off, okay? So that is on 10th March. And then after that, imported 10,000 units at 80 shillings per unit being cost in foreign then. So now here you write here on, on 5th March, 5th March. So imports here, imports. So we said mostly, or most at the time when they, we are told that the transactions are inclusive of VAT, where we have imports, those imports are exclusive. They don't have VAT. Because we have even been told in that sentence, these are cost insurance and then freight, meaning there's no VAT. So the values given here, they represent the costs, the insurance and the freight cost. So here we're going to write here 16, 16 out of 100. This one you have been told clearly. The cost of these goods was 10,000 by 10,000 units and 80 shillings per unit. You multiply by 80. Uh, cost insurance then freight. And then now you include, uh, you multiply by 120 being the import duty. Being the import duty. You multiply this one first, isn't it? It's 153. So this one will be 153, 600. That one will be the VAT in that amount. Then on eighth, purchased 5,000 units from local market at 60. So on 8th March, we have purchases. We have purchases, which is uh, 16 out of 116 times 5,000 times 60. What do you get? Put one, put one, three, seventy nine, put one, three, seventy nine. And then on nine, sold six thousand units at nine shillings per, per unit. So here, ninth of March, sells. He sold how many units? 6,000 units, 16 out of 116 times 6,000 units times 90, which gives you how much? 74, 74, Then purchased office furniture, isn't it? 12th March, office furniture which is office furniture, 16 out of 116 times 40,000. How much is that? 50. So this one will be 55, 17. And then on March 15th, Paid 10,000 shillings for photocopy. Photocopy here, which is 16 out of 116 times 10,000. How much do you get? 13.79. And then on 16, purchase oil filters and lubricants. That is 16th of, so that one will be how much? Oil filters and oil filters, 16 out of 116 times 75,000. How much will that be? Uh, oil itself, filters and lubricants are two different things, isn't it?
10. And then on 16, paid an invoice of 85,000 in respect for fuel for company vehicles. The fuel had been used in February 2018. Remember, we said what we call tax point. There's a delivery date, there's a delivery date, there's a payment date, and there's the invoice date, whichever happened earlier. So this one was delivered in February. So it was accounted for in, fe in February, although the payment is being made in, in March. So that one is a very key thing to remember, what you call the tax point. It is the point where you account for VAT. And we said it's the earliest either of delivery of goods, payment. So the delivery of the oil was done in February and you're in the month of March. Therefore, it was claimed, it, it was accounted for then. So that one, we're going to omit it. Then March supplied 30,000 to department of, on 18th, 18th March. So here, treasury. Treasury is going to be 16 out of 116 times. Thirty thousand times times eighty-five. How much would that be? Three fifty-one. So when you supply mostly to the government agents, especially the Ministry of Treasury, they will hold the VAT because that money belongs to them. Yeah? So they will not give you VAT amount. So you, you indicate on both sides. You get on both. So you write here the same same date. You cancel that amount because it has been held. So you write here Treasury. You cancel it, which is 351, 720. That amount you're not given. On the Ministry of Treasury. Then on March 20th, 20th March. So there was export. There's export, export, you say they are zero rated. So you write there zero. Export to Ghana, that is zero rated. And then on third purchased credit, purchase on credit 5,000 units locally, 80 shillings before deducting a discount. So a discount of 5%, isn't it? So you write here 23rd. So remember VAT is claimed on the actual price the goods were sold. So it will be 2,500 times 80 times 95 percent times 95. So you're going to be 16. That is purchases. You write your purchases. So 16 out of 116 times 2,500 times 95 percent. Times nine, is it 80? 80 times 95 percent. 27, 27, 0, 34. And then we have the director's appropriated goods. So that when you take it as sales, if the director takes goods from the company, it is taken as sales on 27th, of March, even if you donate goods, you pay for the VAT. You pay for the VAT. If you take goods, you pay for VAT. So that is 27th, appropriated goods. Which is 16 out of 116 times 320,000. Forty-four, and then paid for electricity on 28th. There is electricity, how much? 16 over 116 times 15,000. Then on the same date he paid for telephone which is 16 out of 116 times 6,000.
20. So then you compare both sides to find out which side is greater. If the credit side is greater than it's VAT payable, if the debit is greater, the difference is VAT refundable. That is November 2018, question number 2C. In case you have a question, you can pause. By how much? Huh? This side. So this is VAT payable. You write your VAT payable by how much? 84608. Then you know the total. So that is how we do VAT questions. On uh, so we can do that one. You can write, can give you a few minutes. Also do another question on uh, the same on VAT, May 2017, question number 2C. May 2017, question number 2C. May 2017, question number 2C. May May 2017, question number 2C. So the question reads, John Palanga, John Palanga is a trader registered for value added tax VAT. He also offers consultant services for client at a fee. He has provided you with the following information relating to his business for the month of March 2017. So we have consultants fees, local clients, then we have sales of goods, and then we have additional information. So of the goods imported for resale, John incurred a transport cost of 50,000 and a repackaging cost of 20,000 before adding a markup of 20% and later selling them as part of exports. Then the exempt sales had been purchased at standard rates 
and constituted 25% of the, of the match. On 13th March 2017, a customer owing 45,000 was declared bankrupt. And then John received a credit note of 25,000 and sent out debit note of 50,000 during the month. The rate of custom duty was 25%. All the above transactions are quoted exclusive for VAT at the rate of 15% where applicable. Compute the value added tax payable or refundable. John Mpalanga for the month of March 2017. So here we have a case where we have the exempt sales. But now we can be able to identify the, those sales, the purchases that were the, the, the composition of the exempt purchases. So once you are able to identify the composition of the exempt purchases, that is the rate or the proportion of the exempt purchases that uh, uh, resulted in the sales, then you still open the VAT account. You don't, don't restrict or apportion the, the input tax using the DIT method. So here we are able to, to, to identify, isn't it? So you, write, you just open a VAT account. I hope we understand each other. Where you are unable to identify the purchases that are exempt, then you restrict the input tax using DIT. We did that question yesterday. So here you're going to write John Mpalanga. John Mpalanga. John Mpalanga VAT account for the month of for the month of March 2017 March 2017 So we go one by one we had consultants fees, local client. So that is sales. So right here, consultants fees. Consultants fees, local clients. So local here. So that one will be exclusive. We've been told they're exclusive of. So it will be 16 out of 100 times 1587, 1587. 500. So that, that, that is input. Then I'm going to be 254,000. Then we have client DRC. So client DRC, that is zero rated, that is export. Zero, DRC is not in Kenya, that is zero. Sales for good for export, isn't it? So that's when we've been told they were. The export sales, irrespective of note number one, which says on the goods imported for resale, joining guard and import a uh, transport cost of 50. Goods, uh, import goods for resale. So here we have sales of goods for export. Export sales here. Export sales is going to be zero. And then local market, local sales. Local sales are going to be uh, 16 out of 100 times 3,200,000. 500, so 512,000. Then we have email and web hosting. So we have email and web hosting. That one is an input. So here we email and web. It's going to be 16 out of 100 times uh, 92,000. So how much do you get? So this one is 14.7. So that is an input item. Sorry, this one is supposed to be input, input tax. And this one, output tax. So that is how it's supposed to be. And then you got legal fees. Legal fees, so right here, legal fees.
Legal fees is how much? So 16 out of 100 times, 608,000. How much would that be? 97, 280. That is legal fees. Then import for goods, cost, insurance, and freight, CIF. So you've been told import goods for resale. So number one, on the goods imported for resale, John in Ghana, transport cost of 50,000 and packaging cost of 20,000 before adding. So import, imported goods here. So imports here, the imports, isn't it? Uh, so cost insurance then, so when you are claiming VAT, when you're claiming VAT, you only claim on uh, the cost of goods to you. Then now you add value and then you resell, isn't it? So now he exported it. Irrespective of now the export sales will be zero, isn't it? So there's no need to, to consider note number one. But now what was the cost? What was the, 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 the input VAT on those goods? That is what you're interested in. So they, we have been given cost insurance and freight, isn't it? So it's going to be 16 out of 100 in bracket, cost insurance and what was 450,000, isn't it? And then you're going to multiply import duty of how much? Import duty was 20%, 25%, isn't it? Times 1.25, is it so? So this figure 450,000 represents CIF, which means cost insurance and freight. And then we said you add import duty before you claim VAT. How much will that be? So this one will be 90,000 here. That is a VAT. Although this goes, there was some value addition before they were exported. So bottom line is the VAT will be zero. And then consultants fees, plans with the goods on transit. Goods in, so those ones good in transit. So the goods were not yet. So you're consulting people. Uh, I don't think that one, you, that one will be, you not claim VAT on that one. Goods were on transit, isn't it? So you don't claim VAT on goods in transit. Then we have photo, photocopying cost. Photo, photocopy. Photocopying, which is going to be 16 out of 100 times. 90,000, you know who you're happy? 14, and then audit fees. Audit fees is going to be 16 over 100 times 260,000. How much would that be? 41,600. Then we have purchases and rated purchases. Purchases, the standard rate is going to be 16 out of 100 times in bracket uh, 620,000. Out of this, you only multiply 75%. You multiply by 0 0.75, isn't it? Out of this value, we've been told 25% were exempt, isn't it? So we only we know the proportion that is supposed to be claimed, which is 25, which is 75%, isn't it? 25, so, so that, oh, sorry, standard rating in Gapi? Uh, 1,900,000, so this is 1,900,000. Out of this 1,900,000, 25% is exempt. So those standard rated will be 75%. Where am I getting this information in additional information number two? The exempt sales had been purchased at a standard rate 25? Huh? Two? Two twenty-eight. So we had uh, zero rated, you don't. Then exempt sales, exempt sales, isn't it? So this says that we're made in exempt they constituted 25% of the purchases, isn't it? 
So it, is, it was easier for us to, to, to identify the exempt purchases. Therefore, we don't restrict the input tax through computation of the DIT. So, so, so I repeat, where you're able to identify the exempt purchases, then you don't need to compute the DIT. You only compute DIT where it is not possible to identify the Uh, we have additional information number number three. On 13 March 2017, a customer owing for 5,000 was declared bankrupt. So we said if a customer is declared bankrupt, you come and... So when it comes to bankruptcy, we have two things that you need to understand when it comes to issues of bankruptcy. So there's what we call bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is where somebody has been declared the bankrupt, and he has been issued with a certificate of bankruptcy. Therefore, there you claim, you claim the DH in that amount that is still owing directly. But we also have some scenarios where you sold to a customer, that customer is still in business, but he's not paying the debt. So he's not paying the debt, but he's still in B. So for the ordinary bad debts, where the customer is not paying the debt, but is in business, you must wait for more than three years for you to claim bad debt relief. More than three years must lapse for you to claim the bad debt for a customer who's still in business but is not paying. And then now when you're going, going to claim for the relief, you must prove that you've attempted to recover the amount from the customer and then you are unsuccessful. Two, you must also show the documentation that relates to that particular transaction. So you must prove that there was a transaction between you and that particular customer. And then number three, you must also be up to date in terms of filing VAT returns. So your VAT returns in filing must be up to date. And then that is the procedure for you to be able to be to claim bad debt relief. Bad debt relief occurs where you've sold to a customer who is in business but is not paying his debt to you. But bankruptcy, you claim it immediately so long as there is bankruptcy certificate. So once the questions tell you that the well, customer was declared bankrupt, it means that you issued with a bankruptcy. So you claim it immediately. So this one will be 16. Uh, 16 out of 100 times 40. So in other words, you reduce that, um, th that bankruptcy from the output tax or you record the amount on the, the input side. So this one will be 7,200, you record it on this side. And then another thing that is, uh, John received a credit note of 25,000 sent a debit note. So when you receive a credit note, it means there are some goods you had returned. When you receive a credit note, it means it is a reduction of supplier's invoice. So the suppliers are reducing the, the invoices they send to you. So that is mostly, it is a return, it's an indication of return outwards. Return outwards is when you return some of the goods to the customers. So you're going to write here, credit note or return outwards here. Return outwards, how much is it? 16 out of 100 times 25,000. So that is how much? 4,000. And then when you send debit note, debit notes are additional invoices sent. If you're the one issuing them, then it means you are giving more, you're issuing more credit notes to more, more, more invoices. A debit note is an additional invoice to a customer. When you receive it's an additional invoice from the supplier or creditor. So here, debit not issued. When you issue, it's an additional sales invoice. Debit not issued, which is going to be 16 out of 100 times. The amount of debit not issued is how much? 50,000. So you determine the VAT amount in the 50,000, which is how much? Eh? 80,000. 8, so that is the VAT. At that point, I think we have exhausted everything. Eh? So now you come here and compare the two sides. If the credit side is greater than the debit, the difference is called the VAT payable. If the debit side is greater than the credit, the difference is VAT refundable. So can we compare?
So we are discussing today, in addition to doing computation, we are saying we are also going to be discussing theoretical aspect of tax. And today we are going to discuss on public funds. So the public funds, what are public funds? Public funds, these are special funds uh, created by the constitution and organized separately from other government funds to serve specific purposes. So these are funds created by the constitutions and organized differently from other government funds to serve, to, to address specific needs, to, to address specific needs. So these are funds that are separately organized from other government funds and they are set in the constitution to address specific needs. So why do we create this? So we are saying these are funds for special purposes, funds for special purposes, funds for special purposes created by the constitutions to address specific needs that, are, and these funds should be organized differently from other government funds. So reasons for these funds, reasons for public funds. Why do we need public funds? Why do we need this public? Uh, so one, it is because of the budget failure to address some other needs. So some other needs are not adequately addressed in the government budget. Therefore, they need to have these funds to address those specific needs. That is the reason why we create these funds. Number two, and then failure by the budgets also to fully or adequately, uh, adequately to cover some other areas. So the budgets sometimes underfund some other needs. Therefore, they need to specifically identify those needs and then have funds set for them. Then also to protect important programs. So the government have some other important programs that need protection in terms of funding. And therefore, this protection needs to, therefore, this protection needs to come from special funds. Eh? Important programs of the government need to be protected and funded for differently. So when you talk about these specific funds, these public funds, number one, you're talking about, we have what we call, you need to understand what is consolidated fund. This is the first fund here. We have what we call the consolidated fund. Number two, we have what we call uh, the, Equalization fund. We have equalization fund. We have equalization fund. And then number three, we have the contingent fund. Contingent fund. And number four, we have the revenue funds. So you need to understand this. These are the public funds that we're talking about. So they are four. So we have consolidated fund, equalization fund, contingent fund, and revenue funds. There are four. So now we're going to discuss on consolidated fund. We're going to discuss on consolidated funds. So under consolidated fund, you need to understand what it is. And then you need to know how it is administered and how money can be withdrawn from the fund. So here we talk about, you need to understand what, you need to know the meaning of, you need to know the meaning of consolidated fund, number one. And then you need to know how it is administered, administration. And then you need to know withdrawals, withdrawals from the funds, withdrawals from the funds. So those are the three areas that. So what is a consolidated fund? So this is a fund that is created to receive all the monies that are received by the government. So it's a funds account that is created to receive all the money that the government receives. The fund receives all money raised or received by or on behalf of the government, except where money is excluded from the fund by the act of parliament. So all the money that are received by the government must be kept in this fund, except for those funds that are excluded from this fund by the act of parliament. So it's an account that is created to receive all monies received by the government, except those ones that are exempted by the act of Parliament. So that is what is called consolidated fund. And it's kept at the national exchequer or the treasury. So how do we withdraw from the fund? How do we withdraw money from this fund? How do we withdraw money from the consolidated fund? So the conditions under which the money can be withdrawn here is appropriation by parliament. Parliament can appropriate. In other words, it can it can, to appropriate means to divide, it can give it out 
on specific needs. So the parliament can appropriate money from that by an appropriation act by appropriation act by parliament, passed by parliament. So money can be appropriated or divided from this fund for other specific reason by parliament. So by appropriation act by parliament, so money can be withdrawn there. And then through also a supplementary budgets. So government can, the parliament can also come up with a supplementary budget. Uh, a supplementary budget is an, uh, an additional budget. And then there is a resolution by the parliament for the money to be taken out of the, of the, of the account. Or any act or an act of parliament can with, authorize the withdrawal from the fund. So we are saying consolidated fund is a fund created to hold all monies received on behalf of the government. And uh, although, except for those that are exempted from the fund by act of parliament, and the withdrawal from the fund can only be done through an act of parliament, appropriation by the act of parliament or supplementary budget by parliament. How is the fund administered? How does the fund administers? So the national treasury is mandated to administer the condolent fund and to maintain the condolent fund, the national exchequer account kept at the central bank. So the fund is kept by the national treasury and then uh, the CBK. I hope you've understood there, isn't it? That is, then what are the responsibility of the national treasury in administration of consolidated fund? What are, the, what are the responsibilities of the national treasury in regard to administering the national fund? Number one, it's to ensure that all the national exchequer account is not over withdrawn at any time. To ensure that the amount is not over withdrawn in any given time. To ensure that the account is not over withdrawn, that is number one. And then number two, to maintain the condolent fund in account to be known as national exchequer account at the CBK. So to maintain this account in an account called National Exchequer, the CBK, that is number two. And then to administer the account in, a, in regard to the constitution, to follow the constitutional principles and guidelines in administration of the fund. And then number two, to make disbursement or to distribute money in accordance to the prepared schedules by the National Treasury and in consultation with intergovernmental budgets and economic council. So to make distribution from the fund in accordance with the schedule by the national treasury and with consultation with the intergovernmental budgets and economic council. So that is, those are some of the responsibility of the national treasury in regard to Condolated fund. Then we have what we call equalization fund. Equalization fund. So equalization fund. So what is equalization fund? So it is a fund that is created to bring to tweak to, to bring to the same level, those areas that are marginalized. So are, this is a money, this is an, a fund that is kept aside to cater for the needs of the other areas that are marginalized to bring them to the same level as those other areas that are considered a bit developed. So 50% of all the money that is collected is kept in this account. So an equalization fund is an, a fund that is created to cater for the needs of those marginalized areas to bring them to the same level as other areas that are well, well in terms of uh, economy. So the purpose of equalization fund is to provide for basic services, including water, roads, uh, roads, health facilities, and electricities to marginalize areas, to bring the, the, the quality of those services in those areas to the level enjoyed by the rest of the, of the nation. So we're saying closing fund, it is established by the constitution and is allocated 50% of all revenue collected by the national government each year in order to cater for the needs of the marginalized area in terms of uh, uh, education, 
health, road network, infrastructure, electricity. I hope you've understood that one, isn't it? That is equalization fund. So purposes of equalization fund. Purpose of equalization fund we said is to bring marginalized areas to the same level as those other areas that are better off in the nation. So how is the fund administered? How is the fund administered? Administration of the national, administration of the equalization fund. How is it administered or managed? Administration of the, so administration. So national treasury is to administer the funds and keep the funds in a separate account manager at the C. So it is administered by the national treasury and the fund is kept at the CBK. So it is managed by the national treasury, managed by the national treasury, managed by the national, managed by the national treasury in an account kept at the Central Bank of Kenya. So we withdraw from the fund. How is it that, how can you withdraw from the fund? How can we withdraw from the fund? How do we withdraw from the fund? Withdraw from the fund, money can be withdrawn from the fund in accordance with an appropriate act by parliament. So in other words, parliament must give, my, must issue an appropriation act. So parliament must prepare an appropriation act so that this money can be appropriated or disbursed from the account in accordance to the act of parliament, in accordance to the act of parliament. So that is all you need to know on uh, equalization fund. Then we also have what we call the contingent funds, the contingent funds. We also have another fund called here, the contingent funds. The contingent funds. So what is a contingent fund? It's a fund created by the government for emergencies or unexpected outflow, mainly on economic crisis. So this is an account that is created by the government for all emergency purposes, especially during uh, economic crisis or unexpected events. So there's money needed during some very unusual time, like maybe uh, during Corona time, you can remember. So the government need a lot of money. So they, it, we need to have an account specifically to address those issues, emergencies and unexpected events, unexpected outflow of, of cash. So it's an account that is created to hold emergencies, to hold funds to cater for emergencies. So it's an account that is created to hold funds for emergencies or unexpected events that requires outflow cash. So how is, a, a, how is a, the account, the fund administered? The cabinet secretary is the administrator of the funds. The CS for treasury is the administrator of the funds and should ensure the permanent capital of the funds doesn't exceed 10 billion shillings or may be presided by the cabinet secretary with the approval of parliament. So in other words, this fund is maintained by the CS for national treasury and the amount of the funds should not exceed 10 billion unless unless there's an act of parliament that permits the excess of 10 billion so that is how how can the money be withdrawn from the fund how can the money be withdrawn from the fund through an appropriation act by parliament and cbk can only pay into the account money is appropriated to the contingent fund by an appropriation act Advantage from the fund can only be done in case of urgent and unforeseen need. Unforeseen event is one which threatens serious damage of human life or welfare, threatens serious damage to the environment. It means it meant to alleviate damage, loss, hardship, or suffering. So the money can only be withdrawn in this account when there's an unforeseen, unforeseen event unforeseen 
So you're saying unforeseen event is an event that can damage the life of humans and then can cause damage to the environment or can cause suffering. So this fund is meant to alleviate the suffering or stop the damage, to stop the damage. So that is the purpose of that fund. That is called contingent funds. And lastly, we have what we call the revenue funds, the revenue fund. So this is a fund for each county government uh, into which all the county revenues are paid. So the revenue fund is a, is a fund for county governments. So all the monies of the county governments are deposited in that fund. Money cannot be withdrawn unless the control of budget has approved the withdrawals. So that's our, unless the control of budget can approve the withdrawals. So where does the county government get their money? their funds, how do they generate their funds, the county government? Where are their sources of funds to be disposed in this account? Number one is uh, equitable share portion of revenue from the national government. So each and every county has a portion of their share from the national government. That is their first source of money. With their share from the national government, there's a portion of each and every county. Number two, there's local, local revenue generated by the county government. So the county governments have their own ways they have fees and they have licenses. So they generate revenues through their own counties. And then they also do investment. They can also get funding, donations, and the grants. Okay, so those are there. And then why do county government underperform in collection of their revenues? Why do county governments underperform in their revenue? their revenue collection. This question was asked in November 2018, question number 2B. Why do you think that this failure of county government to attain their revenue targets? Hmm? Sorry? So there's corruption inefficiencies and other malpractices where funds a channel to private pockets, that is true. Number two, lack of capacity. So they don't have the capacity to, to ensure that they collect sufficient revenues. In capacity, we mean there's a limitation of human resources uh, to make sure that whoever needs to pay funds, fees for services offered by the county governments are paying and maybe the lack of systems that can be able to enhance revenue collection. So they lack capacity in terms of human resources, machines and other equipments, and then also the system that are able to ensure that they collect enough revenue. And then some others over rely on the national government portion. So they over rely on the national. When you over rely on national government, then you don't make efforts to collect your own revenue. So this over reliant on the national government, that one was fear with their revenue targets. And then there's also lack of political will to ensure that revenue enhancement efforts are started. So lack of political will to initiate uh, revenue generating activities. Uh, and then we have also lack of comprehensive and well set out policies. So lack of policies that can be able to, to ensure that enough revenues are collected. So that is what we call public funds. So you can read this one. This is a very nice topic, public funds. And then we have topic number two, which you're going to discuss in the next class. We call it oversight functions in public and finance management. So if you don't have those notes, I can provide it. So read those ones. And then you also read supply chain management in public entities. So you read those notes. In case you don't have these notes, please ask for them. So I've given you sufficient work to do. Uh, you can start doing that work right now. Melawana? Yes. yes. So in case you don't have notes, any note that you don't have, make sure you alert me so that I can pass them to you. So we've come to an end of our class today. Until next time.